Hey everyone, my name is Zach Redrup and you're listening to the It's Not A Phase podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by Census Fail frontman Buddy Nielsen to talk all about their new album, Hell Is In Your Head, including the reason for the title change, the delays caused by COVID, working with Bo Birchall of Seosin, why it's taken until this record for there to be any featured guests on a Census Fail song, and loads more. Before we get started, let's cover off the boring stuff. If you enjoy this episode and would like to support the podcast, please consider subscribing, rating, and leaving a review wherever you're listening to this. We also have a Patreon, where everyone gets access to each episode a week earlier than everyone else, and a merch store too. You can also follow and reach out to me on social media. All of the links can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's itsnotaphase.co.uk. And with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this week's episode of It's Not A Phase. What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining me on this episode of It's Not A Phase, where I'm joined by Buddy Nielsen of Senses Fail. How are you doing, man? Really good. Thanks for having me. So obviously the big news for Senses Fail is album number eight, uh, Hell Is In Your yeah. Head, is on its way. It's almost here. How are you feeling about finally putting this record out? Oh, it's a relief. It's been uh, hanging around for two years. Uh, it's been, you know, done for two years. It's pretty much been written for two and a half, almost three. Some of these songs are... 2019 it's really when i started like really working on it so yeah it's just a relief to really get it out i'm excited for people to hear it too you know you're like yeah you, know, you never know what people are going to think i mean i've had a lot of different responses to albums you know all across the board you know commercially successful and critically not and then critically successful and like commercially not so i've kind of like i've been able to have a little bit of both you um, run the gamut basically <laughs> yeah yeah so I just, I have some more fans like it. At this point, like, I hope that they enjoy it. Uh, well, so I guess then, number one, you're kind of writing for yourself and, you know, what you want Centers Fail to be. And if fans are on board, then I guess that's a bonus, right? Yeah, I'm a little less, I'm trying to balance in the box of what people want and what I want. And I think I've gotten out of my system the idea that I want to, like, change Census Fail. I think I already tried to do that. And I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to do that where I like abandon what has made the band successful. I think if I ever do that again, it'll be something that's just like a side project or something just for me, you know? Is there any kind of sounds you you want to explore that you've not taken Census Fail into before and you've kind of... Yeah, I, I've gotten really into like synth wave and like sort of like electronic based music or more, more in the world of like analog synth, like retro style, like you know, kind of like cure yeah. type dark wave would be what it would be called. And there's like a hint of element of that on this record, but I don't know. I think that that's something I'll just do on my own. And, you know, if, it, if elements of synth and stuff like that make their way into Census Fail, I think it'll be very minimal. But that's something that I, I haven't explored at all. I mean, I've always been, we've really been an analog band. Not, and, um, we haven't really had a lot of like electronic elements to Census Fail. And, yeah. um, that's something that I think I'm personally definitely exploring on my own and just enjoy kind of have a bunch of synths and getting into that world. So I'm sure some of it will make its way into census fail, but I'm not going to like just randomly make a right turn. It could kind of be like a subconscious kind of thing that seeps its way in and it won't be, you know, too, too abrasive. It kind of be kind of a, a subtle thing that serves the song. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe the original album title was a bit long, wasn't it? Wasn't it that What the Thunder Said, Hell Is In Your Head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind um, of caused the kind of change, like the slight reduction in the title? I think that it was just wouldn't have made a lot of sense to people. And I mean, I've experimented with long, <laughs> I've had some pretty long album names before and I, just had to pick one or the other, I think, you know, and I think I ended up using what the thunder said as part of the song title and sort of the blueprint for um, the T.S. Eliot section of the record. And then hell is in your head was more of the overall idea. It really like grasped what I think I was like the backdrop to everything I was saying was, you know, much of what we struggle with is really a, a self a way in which we view the world. Yeah, and that's kind of something that you've touched on across, you know, a lot of census fail, you know, material. It's, you know, about mental health and personal struggle and self-deprecation and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, now in America too. You know, I think that that's maybe one reason why, like, 
not that other countries don't suffer from mental health and and dealing with it, but uh, th- there's something uniquely like problematic about America. Obviously, that everybody sees is uh, uh, you know people getting guns and just shooting people. It's it's uh it happens all the time. I mean, it's mm. been happening. It's been happening since I was a freshman in high school. Is really when Columbine happened, and you know, there's just something. There's a lot of elements to it. Obviously, one of them being guns and the availability of guns, and then but there's so many elements to it, and, I'm, and I, I'd say the underlying factor is of all that is mental illness. You know, I don't think I don't think people who aren't mentally ill grab a gun and shoot people. That's clearly not the case because mm. if that was the case, we'd have even more shootings. Obviously, I mean, yeah. and not everybody who's mentally ill grabs a gun and shoots people. But there is like deep rooted. I don't want to say like just illness in America that is like deeply rooted in our culture, which we haven't found any sort of like remedy for, you know? And so like, that's why I, I, I always talk about it because I think it's something so many people deal with. And yeah, there is a level of the stigma of mental health that's gone away. But like what I'm trying to talk about is like, well, how do we, how do you like actually deal with it? Like, it's cool that the stigma of mental illness is disappearing, but like the quality of how to actually like move out of like depressive and anxious and just these patterns isn't well defined. And honestly, like is still like we're still in the early stages of figuring out the best practices. And and America is unique because the country is so big, you know? Yeah, um, so you have all these different state laws and how things kind of are regulated and and running cultures. In- yeah, with, within I mean, you know, the the north and the south and the east and the west and the middle. I mean, they're, they there might as well be different countries. You know, I mean, they're culturally different. The lifestyles are different. There's so much. You know, there's just so we have like this unique and and the one thing that like pulls us all together is that we keep having these. It doesn't matter where you are. There are these absolutely violent destructive killings that happen. So, yeah, I mean, I talk about it, I've talked about it for years, but, and this is obviously not reflective on any of this. All this was written before any of the recent shootings. And, but at every single point, it's relevant to talk about this because it's always going to have just happened or just about to happen. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, Yeah. In America, obviously, because, you know, and it just happened. I'm not going to like, it just happened in Copenhagen. It just happened in... There's still a lot we don't understand about mental health and how to help people. And th- that this record is sort of like less talking about my mental health and talking more about like, like how do you work through the grief and, and the trauma that you have so that you aren't stuck in these terrible like mind states for the rest of your life. Like, what do you do? That's sort of like, I think the progress that I've had is that I'm no longer stuck in these mind states. Yeah. And I guess there's, I guess it's gone a little better over the years, but there's always that kind of stigma that there's kind of like a weakness in having mental health and a weakness in discussing it and actually just admitting, you know, I'm, I'm not okay. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think because it doesn't necessarily like, it's not like the remedy isn't like a broken bone you know it's not like oh all i gotta do is tell them i broke my bone and i'll get a i'll get fixed it's like there's it's it's really complicated it's every single person has their own set of like circumstances and there's still no exact proven method that absolutely 100 percent rids people of their neuroses like or or hang-ups or trauma or like there's so many different ways in which people are experimenting still with like how do we deal with this you know we've come a long way like we understand certain practices help and are good and we have medication which is super helpful but again medication doesn't necessarily solve the problem it i think it helps make it so we can like function and then address the problem but it's like unfortunately there's just not you know also in america I, I, we have a healthcare issue too so it's like you know not everybody has healthcare or not everybody has good healthcare and not every mental health professional takes insurance. And, you know, I'm lucky, but to get to where I am mentally, like I've had to invest thousands of dollars into my like well-being. There would have been no other way because the type of mental, like the type of 
therapy that works best for me is still something that is newer and it's not covered by insurances. So I have to pay out of pocket. It's about 200 bucks every visit, you know, and when I'm like going through something, I'm going once a week and that's a lot of money to a lot of people. So they can't just drop, even if they need it, they can't do that. So yeah, we have a lot of problems that are not specific to America, but they're like uniquely American that make it, you'd figure I'd run out of topics or like run out of, oh, like this is a tired subject, but I think it's not because clearly it's, if it was not, then we wouldn't have people doing the insane things they're doing. Because yeah. I, I, I guess that kind of ties in with, you kind of said that this is a, um, this album's kind of like a, like a thematic sequel and continuation of the story. Yeah. In the 2006 album, um, Still Searching, which obviously discussed like um, depression and other mental health topics like that. So like I say, you have been talking about it for, for such a long time, nearly, you know, we, we go off that album just alone. You know, we'll, we're soon approaching the, you know, 20 years since that album came out. Yeah. And I believe it's kind of a continuation of the story of the kind of character that is in that album, Still Searching. Can you kind of briefly explain what this character goes through in Still Searching and where it kind of picks up in this new record? Yeah, the character in Still Searching ends up committing suicide at the end by jumping off of a building, off of the top of like a church, sort of about not being able to find God, you know, and sort of reaching out for help spiritually and not finding it and being sort of stuck in a sort of like a alcoholic depressive just state of anguish and then ultimately you know throwing himself off a building and then this picks up where the spirit or soul goes when you die and it goes my envisioning it is it goes to t.s Eliot's the wasteland which is actually you wrote it when he was living in in london he ended up dying i think he ended up passing away in London too. But anyways, so he wrote this, uh, his, it's his most famous work. And um, it's, it's sort of like this alternate universe, a take on modern society in his time, creating this, the wasteland, which to me was sort of like this, like alternate universe or spiritual plane where this spirit goes after you leave the body and he ultimately goes and is able to deal with the grief that he's encountered and meets the spirit of his grandmother who says that it's not time for him to die. So then he goes back into his body and then the rest of the record is sort of like modern back in the body being a parent and living in, in the life that I'm currently living. So the first half of the record is the wasteland. It sort of starts off too with like a descent and in us, you know, the record sort of has this ascent and descent aspect to it. And the first song is in the same key as the last song. Actually, the first song is in the relative minor to the last song on the uh, on Still Searching yeah. as well. So um, and then half the records in minor, half the records in major. So that was the other thing, too, to like really give it this dynamic and like a sort of like a tone and like a, a backdrop for which to sort of put all these songs together. That's the idea. There, I don't have like, we're not like Coheed where we have this like comic, like it's not like written yeah. exactly. It's more just to give me like. Kind of like a direction, a, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then I like, you know, I don't necessarily fill in all the points. Like it's not like uh whatever, like a Green Day. What was that one? My American right, Idiot. Is that the one? Yeah, it's not like that. It's not like, you know, line for line and, you know, it's not like a, a play or anything, but. So you're not, you're not considering doing a rock opera anytime soon then? Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned it earlier, you know, you, you started recording the album at the beginning of 2020 in, in February, I think. And then obviously the world kind of went on fire with COVID. Did that kind of like, I assume the lockdowns and stuff is what kind of made you have to pump the brakes on recording the album? Yeah, we were almost done with the record, unfortunately. Like, we were two weeks away. All we had to do is, like, finish up a little bit of stuff and then record the drums. But we hit the pretty much that, like, the shutdown in March. And, yeah, I was just, like, shut it down. We ended up getting back in the studio in August and finishing the record. Right. And then the idea was to 
release it on the Bayside tour, which was going to be early 2021. And then that obviously got pushed back to fall. And then by then we were like, should we just wait? And so on and so forth. And now we're, we're here where the record's coming out in July. Plus we also got bumped multiple times by um, vinyl issues with Adele having like a massive, massive vinyl buy, which Oh, so she got back. priority over you guys. Oh yeah. She got priority <laughs> over almost the entire industry because yeah. her vinyl order was so big that it's like the bigger the order, the more priority you get because right. you're obviously like, you know, and then we got pushed for like a Taylor Swift record too. So we ran into two really big things because, that pushed us back as well as our touring schedules. So it was just like, yeah, we've just been a victim of circumstance really. Yeah. Sometimes they're putting out albums and it's not until like maybe almost a year later when they actually can put up the vinyl, which is crazy. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, we had that happen with, uh, we did a vinyl, we did a our own vinyl. We pressed it and everything for a... Uh, a live record we did in Joshua Tree from a live stream, and it still is just about to ship. And it it was done a year ago. Crazy. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's sort of the nature of things. And uh, I just worked really hard on this record. I didn't want to, I just didn't want to have anything go wrong. I just wanted yeah. it to, like, at least be the most cohesive release it could be. Yeah. Because while I've been done with it for a while, it's still brand new to everyone else, you know? Yeah. It doesn't have an age to them. It's just, it's new. So do, do you think that kind of unintentional break that COVID kind of gave you, did you kind of have time to reflect on the album when you did go back to try and finish it off? And did you make any kind of tweaks off the back of that? Or did you just literally? No, no, I decided that? I didn't want to touch it. I decided if I started like going back, I would just, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, it was done. So much was done. Everything was done except for, because we've been recording drums last. I think it's actually a better way to record music, but we've been doing drums last. So everything was done waiting for the drums to be done. So it was like, I would have had to go back in and like really change things. And I don't know. I just didn't feel like doing that. I spent time working on, on like becoming a, an engineer and working on skills like uh, just editing and, and just becoming better in the studio. And so really I used the pandemic to really become like a, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I could work professionally as an engineer. I'm not a mixer, but I can get really good sounds and I, and I know how to edit. And like, you know, I, I functionally could record our own record, whether I do that or not. I don't know. But that's kind of what I spent the pandemic, like really focusing on. Is that something you'd like to do to record a, a census fail record at some point? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've recorded the songs here and there for like, we've had a couple of little releases and I've done those. I'd have other people mix them. But yeah, I think as, as we go, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to want to like full on like engineer all the parts of the record, but I definitely want to be involved. And I definitely, as far as demoing and even like, oh, if we need to turn something around real quick, like we get an opportunity, I can record the whole thing, obviously. You know, when it comes to like a full on record, I, I don't know, you know, and I guess it really depends. I think I have some ideas for things moving a couple of releases that I want to do that I will do that, but they won't be like full length records. Kind of like one off singles or a short EP or B yeah. stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I've, I think I saw on Twitter that you mentioned like, even before the lockdowns happened that this was the longest that you'd spent on working on a record so far for Centers Fail. What kind of contributed to that? What, what kind of made it such a notably longer process? I think, I think that I just didn't really want to settle for anything. I wanted to really like, you know, in the past, like if I thought a song was good, it was going to make the record. And now it was like, I, I have all, I have like 20 songs that didn't make the record that could have, but didn't fit the, the idea or the vibe or, or they sounded too much like another song on the record. So I like had to write more to get the result I wanted. Plus, I, I, I don't know, I'm still really becoming like a songwriter, having really only, you know, the last record I wrote a lot of the songs on, and then I wrote a lot of them with someone. And this record, I wrote most of them by myself. You know, I, I kind of worked with a couple people just sporadically to try to get just some different, it's just easier to write songs with people than it is alone, or it's fun too as well. So I worked with a couple different people, 
but yeah, I mean, you know, I've only really, really been writing songs on my own for like 2017. So, you know, this is like my second attempt at writing a record. The first one where I really did the majority of it alone. And, uh, you know, to do that and to accomplish your sonic goals, you also have to learn lots of like engineering, doll work, like just like, you know, like learning how to do a podcast. Like you need to learn a whole new set of skills, which, you know, if you're like trying to translate your idea and it sounds like shit, it's going to be very uninspiring. So you have to figure out through repetition and learning, like, you know, how do I make my guitar sound like I want it to so that I can be inspired and then show people, you know, what I'm trying to do. So honestly, a lot of the process was like, learning how to engineer and edit and like, you know, really, really, really learning how to produce, produce, I guess, produce sounds and produce songs and music theory, you know, and becoming a, a good enough guitar player to execute what I want and be able to play it. So that was like real, pro- the real process of this record is I really became like, I guess, a, mus- a musician. Because it's, it's all well and good having these, these great ideas in your head, but if you can't execute them, then... It's, you kind of hit a dead end, haven't you? Yeah, 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 exactly. So it was like the process of like really, 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 really learning that and, you know, investing in that. And and now I have that skill. So now it's really easy for me, of course. Now, it, now it's like, oh, yeah, I want to do a metal song. Or I want to do a slow song. Or I want to do this. So I need, you know, this kind of guitar and this pedal and this is the deal to get this sort of sound. And yeah, so... It was really just building that ability and that just took a long time. I guess working with, um, cause you went, you went with Bo Birchall of, of Sayerson again for, to help you kind of produce the, the album, D- you know, what does he kind of, what do you think he helps bring to the census fail sound? And did, I guess, obviously his expertise kind of helped give you some tips and pointers and ideas that. Oh you- yeah. I mean, he definitely helped me be like, this is how you should like EQ things. And this is how you should gain structure things. And, you know, these are, you know, don't worry about spending money on this mic and get these preamps and all this stuff, all like the knowledge from all the years he's been producing, help me get the skills. But then also like he knows what makes Sense of Fail successful from an outside perspective. So he's able to be like, just sort of steer my like ideas and, and keep them within a good like lane so that other Census Fail fans will like it you know, and, and appreciate it while also still experimenting with different, you know, things that are fun. Like it's fun to play with pedals and twist knobs and like do things in the studio that are sort of happy accidents. And it kind of helps that he's, yeah. you know, he's, he's in your, you know, say it's in a, you know, within the same territory as you guys in terms of genre. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then he'll sprinkle in some really cool riffs. Like there's a couple riffs on the record that he just wrote was just like, we're just sitting there and, I'm like, yeah, I need something that goes like this. And he's like, yeah, what about this? You know, he's a much more talented guitar player than I am. Yeah. So there's some bow riffs on there. And so those, those sort of things work when I'm like, yeah, I want to do like a sort of a complicated lead that I can't play, but I know what I want it to be like. I can just hand him the guitar and something cool comes out. And then you take it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't play any of this shit live. So, I mean, <laughs> I sing it, but I don't I don't play guitar. Our guitar players are so good anyways that like yeah. this the shit I do is like baby stuff, you know. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm still in like the infancy of my guitar playing. I don't I um I mean, we'll see. We'll see how much I invest in the skills of guitar playing versus the skills of uh just some other some other because it's like it was really like, do I invest in my guitar skills or do I invest in my engineering skills? Because that's the thing. It's like, now that I've invested in that, it, it's like, do I invest in my guitar skills or do I invest in mixing? Should I just knock it all out and then I'll mix it too? Or should I, you know, so it's all about splitting your time in like skill acquisition, which is like really what I've kind of been doing as a musician over the last, I guess, five years, really. Yeah, I wish I wish I started earlier. Honestly, I wish it was a mindset that I had earlier. Better late than never. So, I mean, well, I think also too, like with YouTube and like with the internet. I mean, I couldn't have I couldn't have acquired these skills. They wouldn't have been available to me. Like, yeah. and I'm not saying I'm a master. I'm not gonna be a master of any of it. But unfortunately, the modern the modern musician, like 
kind of has to be a jack of all and a master of none. Like if I was really, really good at one thing, I would need to be so far head and shoulders above everybody else good at that thing for me to stand out. It's kind of just like the the songwriting, like a band is kind of, you know, a business. It, you have to be like a social media master as well, to, you know. 100%. Nowadays. And I've had to, yeah, I've had to invest in that as well as like, you know, buying a camera and learning camera skills and like learning like what people want to see, like what works. Cause it's like, cool, I make all this music and all this stuff, but like if I'm not promoting it correctly or in the right places or any of this stuff or doing the work that needs to be done, it's going to be, it's not going to reach its audience. So it's, it's like, there's so many things you have to do now that you didn't have to when I first started. Like it was very simple, mm-hmm. write the songs, be able to play them live and go on tour. That's it. Now you don't necessarily have to be able to play them live, but I still do. If anybody wants to actually make money, they have to be able to tour. Because that's the thing that we've seen is like there's all these artists that have millions of plays, but they don't really have like a, a live business. Yeah. And uh, it's really hard for you to make money on streaming. Yeah. Isn't it, it like, I mean, I don't know the exact number. Isn't it kind of like a, a fraction of a pence for every stream you get on Spotify or something like that? Yeah. And, and if you're not like me, I mean, I'm the person in the band. So, you know, usually I have a couple of members. You're going to split that fraction up into some fractions. and. You know, it's a, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of work for not a lot of like, I mean, art has never been, it's like feast or famine, you know, it's like, you're either the biggest artist in the world or you're not. There's no, like, what I've tried to do is be like a middle-class band, you know, it's like not the biggest, but we've had a long career and we've had sections of like big success and we have a legacy. So becoming like a middle class band is really the goal and to do that you have to take on a lot of the workload because you just don't have the ability to offload that on to like other people so you got to really be the spearhead behind all of it you know i've recently had to get into tiktok i've been like defiantly anti-tiktok and i just have to because it's just like i just and it's not because i dislike tiktok it's like just because like i don't want to have to learn another social media and be creating content for another social but it's just part of the deal it's part of the job description so it's just it's what i gotta do just something else tried onto your plate basically well yeah and then well, unfortunately like where i'd like to be learning like scales and getting better at like playing solos it's like i've got to videotape myself playing a riff to put on tiktok you know and that takes like two hours to do to edit to make decent so it's like there goes two hours that i could have invested in this but it's all that's just the deal so there's never uh like a you never reach the pinnacle of the amount of things you need to know how to do to be able to like operate as a functional musician now yeah, it just keeps, it's never ending, isn't it? I think you do, you know, you, you learn new things. You've got, like you say, TikTok, you're becoming an engineer and stuff like that. So power to you, man. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, it's fun too. It's like, I don't think I'd be like doing it if I didn't actually like enjoy it as well. Like if I really, really hated it, if I really didn't like any of this stuff, obviously I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Like I wouldn't, I don't think you can learn really well things you're not like actually invested in like you don't like anyway like i would want to learn how to i'd be writing songs and making music and noises and learning how to engineer like that would be something i would probably do regardless of whether i did it in senses fails so it just all kind of works out so it works that's hopefully why you choose something you like doing with your life so that when you have to learn these skills it's not this complete utter like life soul-sucking endeavor (laughs) I mean, TikTok might be, but TikTok's actually turned out to be, I like it because you get results. And that's what I like. Like, that's the shitty thing about social media. And the shitty thing about being a musician now is like, you invest all this time and then you go to the social medias to put it out there and you don't even get like feedback because there's an algorithm that's usually behind a paywall that always can't even... You can't even act. You don't even know what it is. And then you can't even access your fans. It sucks. And like with a TikTok, I'm like, oh shit. Like we have 4,000 fans, but 30,000 people saw this. I'm like, all right, I get it. Like, yeah. I get it. That feels better to me than Instagram, which it's like 
dude, we have 60,000 fans and only 2,000 people saw this. Like, what a fucking waste. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, it's the fairest algorithm on, on TikTok, you know. You don't have to go, go and do stupid dances and stuff. You've just got to put out good content, which is, I think that's the fairest deal that any social media does. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be, like, fucking, like, curated. Because that, that's what because there was a time when everything had to be, like, look great and curated. And now we're getting away from that. I think people are, like, pushing back and going, no, we want to see like what people are really doing and the content they're really making. And it doesn't need to be like this, like, don't try to sell us something. And yeah. that's easier to create because I can just make that. Like, yeah. I don't have to have like with YouTube or something like it's got to look good. Like if it looks like shit on YouTube, people aren't buying it. And yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, it's, uh, I've found TikTok to actually not be actually enjoy it better because it's just, it's easy. And you have access to the people that follow you. I, I agree. I agree. And, and returning to the to the album, um, you've got Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills on there, and you've also got Connie from See You Space Cowboy doing a feature as well. You know, are these? I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I saw, are these the first features on a on a Census Fail song? Yeah, yeah. I eight, you know, eight yeah. albums deep. You know, it's yeah. I mean, it's just honestly, it's like it's something we've always talked about, but again, like. It, well, one, rock people just didn't do this. And it, like, up until recently, I don't want to there's always been a barrier of, like, yo, we got to get the person in the studio to do this. And yeah. now, because of the pandemic, but also, like, people and their own ability to record themselves or just know people to do it, you can easily get someone to do something remotely. And I think over the course of the pandemic, it's just been obvious that, like, not only do people like it, but I think it, it does something for music that rock bands have always been sort of like at least resistant to, which I, even I've been somewhat resistant. It's like, yo, we wrote this song. This is our song. You know, we're not trying to share this with another artist. Yeah. Whereas hip hop has always actually been the opposite. Like, yo, we didn't even write this song. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like some guy wrote it and I rapped over it. So we should have somebody else do that too. You know, and rock has always been a little bit more like, no, we like recorded this, wrote it, had to get proficient enough to record it. And it feels very much like ours and that yeah. we're just like highlighting another artist on it seems, I don't know, it, 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 but over, you know, you, younger bands are doing it a lot. And I just think it's cool to do. And then I was able to be on the Ice Nine Kill song and yeah i just think it uh i did a couple of features that actually haven't come out yet but it's been recorded and stuff i guess it helps you kind yeah. of you and the band you feature on and, and vice versa they kind of cross pollinate fans so for example 100 percent. i think that that's Cowboy also fans see you and vice yeah. versa i think that's also the, the beauty of it is with spotify it's instant it's like oh who's that i want to check this out vice versa you know back when you're we selling physical copies you know, just because you heard it didn't mean you were going to go out and buy the record, but, you know, obviously raised awareness, but it didn't translate into exact, oh, I can just listen to this. Now it's like, yeah, I could just go listen to all their music, which I think is, uh, is really cool. That's, that's super cool. And I think a big reason why it's really beneficial for everyone, honestly, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt. It only helps. And, I hope to do more in the future, like actually write from scratch with people would be super cool. But what, what made you want to, obviously you did the the feature with Spencer on the latest Ice Nine Kills album. So I guess that was kind of like some form of, I don't want to go as far as like a trade-off, but it just kind of made sense yeah. that kind of worked with him. What made yeah, you want to also get Connie on board out, out you know? You well, I think we, we'd always, we'd hit up the pure noise and been like, yo, like we're, we're doing this, like, you know, we'd love to do more of it. And they're like, you should do this with connie i think you know they, they're fans in the band and vice versa so we should make this happen they have a record coming out and just kind of just you know that was definitely like a label thing but i thought i mean i mean i was familiar with the band so it was obviously like oh yeah that that's a great idea so yeah i, I guess it brings us a new kind of spin to the song in contrast to if they didn't feature on the on the songs at all yeah absolutely so you, you guys are also set to play um when we were a young festival later this year, you know, with, with so many peers that you kind of, you know, broke through with as well as like a few new bands and stuff like that. And a few people have even gone as far as to call when we were young festival, the emo fire festival, which is. Yeah. 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 Uh, what are your, what are your feelings on the, 
on the festival and how was that kind of offer presented to you because I, I i think i've seen a few bands it might one of them might have been hawthorne heights kind of say the only thing they knew about the festival before accepting the offer was that my chem were going to play and that was it i didn't even know anything I, I i know the promoter so i was like yeah we've and we've done uh we did when we were young a couple of years ago it was a smaller fest we played with morrissey it was awesome we were with ampi right. morrissey it was super it was super cool and i've known you know i've known the dude who is putting on the fest he used to do book chain reaction so i've known him like my whole life right. and you know it was like yeah so when it came out when it was announced i was like oh my god what the <laughs> fuck is this because i had no idea you know i didn't know and it's i like agreed the, to like it the like, ultimate emo lineup basically <laughs> yeah it was i agreed to it like nine months beforehand it was like i didn't realize like realize that we were playing with so many bands and, and you know it's crazy so i think it'll be awesome i mean it's gonna be awesome it's gonna be super cool i live in vegas too so it's really easy i don't have to go anywhere <laughs> <laughs> you can just stumble on home as soon as you're done <laughs> you know you can just go right home you know so it's really easy for me and uh i'm, I'm pretty stoked about that so that's yeah. gonna it'll be fun but yeah i didn't know i was like hawthorne heights i had no idea and they were doing a hawthorne heights festival so that'll be fun yeah they have a festival they're doing they're putting on and uh, yeah, so we got like those two fests in the fall, and then we uh, we got some other stuff we haven't announced yet. And then we're yeah, we're going over, going on tour with uh, Silverstein. Yeah, you're coming over here, aren't you? I think it's is that your first UK tour in is it seven years? Seven years, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a long time. So <laughs> yeah, we're going over with uh, with Silverstein and Comeback Kid, and yeah, I'm just stoked to finally be able to get back out and do the thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. This year, 2022, is the 20th anniversary of Census Fail, right? The 20th anniversary, yeah. It's kind yeah. of getting like a little eclipsed by the record, which we've, you know, it's like, what do you focus on? Your 20 year or do you focus on your new record? And, yeah. you know, we've chosen to focus on our new record because it just, you know, you put all this time into your record. Like, I think we'll probably, uh, we'll probably do an anniversary next year. You know, in America, 21 is the drinking age. So 20 is nothing to celebrate really everybody celebrates their 21st birthday yes. so we'll probably do some kind of spin on that but i want to celebrate it the goal was always to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the band. Have different plans but yeah so it's like it just kind of got pushed back just like everything else so next year we're planning on celebrating the 20th 21st anniversary just the 22 decades of census fail i think we'll probably call it that like two decades of census fail and we're working on a special release for it and doing, I'm already work. We're working on it now, kind of like getting that together for next year. So we already have some touring plans. So yeah, we're already like well into next year with our plans and, and what we're going to do. And I already have records done and ready. So we'll also be releasing records after that as well. Oh, nice. so, Is that because of the yeah, amount of time you had from yeah. how long the album's been, been waiting basically? A hundred percent. I, I'm not confused about what we're going to do. It's just a matter of like, now it's just doing it, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's great news for Census Fail fans. Lots of stuff coming very soon. And, you know, like I say, you guys have been going for 20 years. You consider one of the most influential and important bands of the emo and post-hardcore scene. Um, you know, almost eight albums, a handful of EPs, thousands of record sales, toured pretty much every corner of the world. When you look back at your career in Census Fail, what do you feel are the biggest highlights and what are the biggest lessons that you've you've learned over those years? I mean, the highlights are hard just because there's like a lot. I mean, there's so many. I think definitely getting signed and doing our first tour and then, you know, the last record being received well and successful, I think was also like a real highlight for me. I mean, all the, I mean the Taste of Chaos, the first Taste of Chaos is a big highlight, I think. Um, the lessons, I, I guess it's like, there's some level of like persistence and perseverance that has to like dominate being a musician because there's a lot of reasons to quit. And like, it wasn't always financially, like you just have to learn so much about life and business and art and creativity that it, it's to boil it down to the, the, the years that most people are bands, which is like, you know, maybe five to six, seven years. It's like, it's, it's crazy that we were able to, really keep it together to have the success that we had to like give us the ability to still be here i mean the, I mean, the lessons i've learned are countless but I, I really think it's like you really have to have your own 
vision and a large part of it is not throwing in the towel. I, I, I really think like it's hard to be an influential legacy band if you at some point quit. It's so people ask, like, how did Sense of Scale become that? I guess, it, I guess it's also because we never quit and we never actually put out anything that sucked. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like we might have put out records that maybe weren't as good or different or we're battling it. We're, we're always battling like a classic nostalgic. We're battling two classic nostalgic records. So, you know, if you're if you heard us when you're 16 years old, like it's going to be very hard to top nostalgia. And a lot of people get discouraged by that and they either stop trying or they just quit. And for me, it was always like a challenge of like, well, you know, I still know, like, if we wrote that then, there's always the potential to have that sort of magic happen again. And it's also like, if people just ultimately like these two records, like, and that gives me the ability to be creative continually, like, what does it matter whether they like this new record or that record or one gets them in the door and vice versa? I, I don't, I don't really, I gave up on like really caring what version of Sense and Fail people are like holding on a pedestal or whatever so to me as long as people are like discovering it and listening and like being a cornerstone of the genre i think it's like comes with also ne- having the full catalog and also it never really feeling like we were like throwing you know like like giving up yeah like throwing thrown in the towel and like oh this is not a great record or they didn't put time and effort into this and yeah i i, I think those are the lessons i mean it's really hard now to even envision a, a band able to be around for longer than five years because uh, it's 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 such a different world now but yeah i'm just super lucky yeah i mean not, not a lot of bands make it even half as as long as you guys have so i think you know you, you should always give yourself credit for that like, and you never like, there's, there's never any kind of hiatus really either for you guys no never we, no we've the longest we didn't tour was the pandemic <laughs> yeah, and that was kind of forced on you so yeah yeah we didn't even choose that so yeah. uh yeah you know even within that time frame we still got a release out and some christmas songs yeah, yeah. christmas songs uh misfits covers and then we did the live stream so yeah. we were still somewhat active census fail never stop <laughs> yeah we never stopped never so. stop well before i let you go and enjoy the rest of your day have you got any final words anything you want to plug anything you want to say no uh, thank you for all the support absolutely man thanks again for for jumping on i really appreciate you taking the time out especially with you out and about and traveling and stuff yeah of course thank you enjoy the rest of it enjoy your touring thanks again dude take care yeah, thank you hope to see you bye and that's it thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed the episode please consider supporting the podcast in any way that you can we have a patreon where you can get access to each episode a week early along with some other perks a merch store or you can leave a review wherever you're listening to this. You can also follow me on social media or subscribe to the newsletter where I'll send out each episode to you via email along with regular playlists. All of this can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk That's itsnotaphase.co.uk Thanks again for listening and remember, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle.